Hi, Nisha here. We're going to look at Melanie Klein and her work, Object Relations, and in two parts. This is the first part of two lectures. So first of all, I always say to my students, if you want to understand Melanie Klein, you have to get into the mindset of the baby. And I encourage my students to become a baby for that lecture um, and to get into the world of the baby because people don't understand Klein. And the main reason for that is they're trying to understand her from an adult mind. And it's just you're giving yourself a hard time there. Um, tutors don't like teaching object relations. Students never understand it after they've had their lectures and so on. There's a usual struggle around Klein, um, which I seem to be able to get round. I start by saying, OK, let's think about infantile ways of thinking. What's yours is mine. What's mine is my own. What's yours is half mine and half the other half's mine. So it's all mine. If you think about babies and children, it's all about gratification for the self, the way that they think. And I want to encourage you to get into that way of thinking a little bit, that kind of raw, primal way of thinking in order to understand her theories. But let's just move away for a moment into her history briefly. So she was born in Austria in 1882, Polish, Hungarian, Jewish, youngest of four children. Her mother, she described as being neurotic and manipulative and was quite controlling as well. She wasn't very nice to Klein. She told Klein that she wasn't intended. She even told Klein that she preferred her brother over her. Despite this, surprisingly, she was close to her mother and close to her brother. Her brother was like a father figure to her. Her own father was a medical professional, but due to anti-Semitism, he had to focus on dentistry. He tended to ignore Klein and, and made it clear that his favourite daughter was Emily. Um, there was a death early on. Her other sister died, aged eight. Um, and then later, her father died in 1900. And then her brother died a couple of years later of TB. Klein married a year after her brother's death in 1903, and she had three children. Throughout her um, births of her children, she was suffering from depression on and off. We would probably diagnose that now as postnatal depression. And the way that this was dealt with was that her mother kept sending her away from her children at the time. So there's an experience there of separation and loss uh, intermittently every time she had a depressive episode. Um, her mother died in 1914 and this is where she moves into psychoanalysis and discovers therapy um, and she had therapy with someone called Forenzi who was one of um, Freud's uh, group if you like um, and he encouraged her to work in a new and underdeveloped field and this was the field of psychoanalysis with children. She was almost sounding like a father figure to her, encouraging her to do that. And don't forget, she didn't have a good relationship with her own father, so this is likely to have been part of the, the therapeutic dynamic. Now, she couldn't find patients, which was absolutely normal at that time. Um, everybody else was struggling with the whole idea, all these new therapies emerging and not being able to prove their theories and how they're going to prove it and so on. She couldn't find patients, so she analysed her own children, and she had a lot of stick um, about that and criticism but actually a lot of therapists were doing it it wasn't uncommon a lot of therapists analyzed their own children and disguised them as case studies as she did now she she left her husband the relationship broke down and they later divorced in 1926 and this is where she went into therapy for a new therapist called carl abraham sadly he became terminally ill and she had to cease the therapy with him she moved to London later with her youngest son. She left the other two children to complete their education. She had a very bad relationship with her daughter, Melita, um, who openly opposed her theories, publicly attacked her ideas. And so there was a bad dynamic playing out live in a way. Klein suffered three early bereavements, her sister, her father, her brother. And then she had her mother's death later on. Her marriage ended, which was another loss, and her second therapist became terminally ill, so there was another loss there. In 1934, her son Hans died in a climbing accident. Now, Melita, who didn't get on with her, blamed this on Klein, saying it was a suicide. There is no actual proof or evidence of that. 
Her ex-husband dies in 1939 and her sister Emily dies in 1940. So she was almost in a continuous state of mourning throughout her life. And this may or may not, I, I probably think it has, um, had an impact on her theoretical ideas. She didn't receive success or um, uh, any good positive feedback about her approach until right at the end, just before dying in hospital in 1960, she finally received success. Now let's look at her theory, object relations theory. It grew from Freudian theory, okay? Um, she picked the word object, and so it was carried over from the Freudian idea that there was a target of the instinct. The instinct had to find its target, okay? And so she called this target the object, okay? So she's carried over that part of the idea, but the rest of it is really very, very different. First of all, she's saying rather than biological drives, it's about how a baby meets the world, so it's relational. Freud is talking about his Oedipal stage as being very crucial sexual development, and the most important years are the years between three and seven. Whereas Klein is saying it's about objects that the baby comes into contact with. It's relational. And the first three months up to the first year are crucial. So she's basically saying, no, we need to look at the baby's experiences much, much earlier on than Freud was saying. And this is a big difference because everyone's saying oh, there's no point looking at baby's life before the age of three. We have to start later on. There's something to look at then. There's more to analyze. She's saying actually there's a hell of a lot going on before then. Now, Freud says the adult mind can only be understood in terms of the formative experiences of child, right? Whereas Klein's comment would be that life is about managing the conflict between the urge to love and the urge to hate and destroy. And it's about trying to manage these uh, relational conflicts that we have. Now, whenever I teach this lecture to my students, I throw them right into the deep end and I give them this quote or we read this quote together and analyze it together directly from Klein's mouth. Um, and I feel very strongly that if you understand this quote and you can get your head around this quote, you will understand Klein. So let's look at this together and break it down in sections. First of all, the infant feels their impulses as the exchange of bodily substances, for instance, milk, feces and urine. So the infant doesn't have an adult developed brain. It's experiencing the world via its body and via the exchange of body substances. If it's having some milk um, and it's feeling good about that, it's having warm milk going on down, it's pleasant, you know, then the world is OK. It's a nice feeling. If the baby is really hungry and there's pain in its stomach and it doesn't know what hunger is and it doesn't know why it's feeling that, then in that moment, the exchange of milk doesn't feel pleasant. If the baby is feeling really pained in some way again and it expels urine or feces in that moment, it's exchanging something based on its experience in that moment. So it's an unpleasant exchange. If it's feeling really content, it's had a good nap, it's had a good feed, there's, there's no bad feelings in the body or anything upsetting it and it expels feces or urine in that moment, it's a positive exchange in that moment. OK, so when she adds there or the use of these substances as a weapon, she's basically talking about it's being dependent on how the baby is feeling in that moment. Doesn't understand why it's feeling anything. But in that moment, if it simply feels the absence of pain or the opposite, it feels some kind of pain, it doesn't understand. If it's feeling the pain in that moment, then these substances become a weapon in that moment. It's, it's, it's almost like... I don't know if you have children yourself, when they expel feces, it sometimes shoots out. And if they're in a bad state in that moment, it's like literally like a bullet or a weapon, you know. Let's move on. Love is taking in the good milk or feeding the mother with the baby's stored up goodness. What this is talking about is the symbiotic relationship between the mother and the baby. In that moment where the warm, sweet, delicious milk is going down, the baby doesn't know if it's receiving something from mother or, you know, getting something from somewhere else. It doesn't understand any of that. In that moment, it could be giving something good to the mother. It could be doing the mother a favor. I'm feeling good right now. I'm doing something for you. You're, you're, you're getting something from me. 
there's no distinction at this stage like like with an adult mind so love is taking in the good milk or giving the mother some milk with stored up goodness yeah next part here urine and feces are valuable gifts and in giving them in reality or in fantasy the child feeds loves the mother so at the opposite of these substance body substances of urine and feces when you're in a good state you know you're content you've had a good sleep your tummy's full and you expel urine or feces they are these are almost like giving something it's like i've got something good to give and in fantasy the child is giving loving feeding in that moment it doesn't understand anything else so it's just doing something positive in that moment and then at the end there, anger is a poisonous attack on the self or the other by the same body substance is now good, now bad and destructive. Again, it's talking about um, the substances being dependent on the, the experience of the baby in that moment. But there's an added addition here that anger is a poisonous attack on the self. So if the baby is feeling bad for whatever reason, not good, bad in some way, and, and therefore irritable and angry or whatever it is, it might, it might be even attacking itself as well as the world around it. It's just as much an attack on the self as the other. So let's move further from that into the baby's world and understand what object relations mean. So I always ask my students, what does a baby come into contact with? I force them to come out with a list. The baby comes into contact with a breast, a nipple, a bottle teat, a dummy, milk, faces, body parts, toys, blanket, nappy, cot, substances like water which can be hot or cold or light or sounds all of these are basically objects that the baby comes into contact with it doesn't see big whole things it relates to these parts of things as objects you know it doesn't see the whole body in that moment it just sees a face peeping into its cot looking at it it sees a hand come up into its vision it sees a, a soft blanket come up near its face it sees water that it's just become in contact with and so on or the nappy that feels wet or dry or whatever so this is the world of the baby it comes into contact with ob objects and this is what is d described as object relations now to add to that these objects can be good or bad they can be exciting or rejecting so if you think of a face that comes into the cot if it's a face that doesn't look happy and looks angry it becomes a bad object a not nice object a rejecting object a scary object a frightening object yeah negative if the face is smiling and making noises and looks really happy this becomes an exciting happy good object and if you go into the bath and the water is too hot or too cold that water has become a rejecting object. If light is too bright, it's a rejecting object. If noise is too sudden, it's a rejecting object or bad object. Or if it's nice music that's calming, it's a nice object. If it's a nice soft blanket, it's nice. If it's a toy that drops on you and it's hard, it's a bad object. So you should be understanding by now this is the world of the baby comes into contact with these objects which mean different things depending on on um, how they're experienced and this is where the term the good breast bad breast comes from basically you know if the baby is feeling um, happy and having some breast having a breast feed the breast is good in that moment it's a positive good object good breast if the baby is feeling starving and it's been too long since it ate anything or it's been deprived of attention or it feels colic and pain in its stomach or whatever and the breast comes along in that moment it's a bad object it's the bad breast that's all it means so let's look at this object relating and take it a step further it's part object relating the baby can only relate to parts it can't relate to holes at this stage they can't see whole big things they can only relate to parts of objects or parts of a person so the baby relates to the mother's breast older children can regress to part object relating if they feel stressed about the world around them they want to deal with only safe bits or safe parts or they just have the dummy or have a blanket so they're dealing with small safe objects in safe amounts Part object relating can play out with adults as well. They might relate to a body part rather than a person if it's someone who's a pornographer or a paedophile. Or maybe they relate to a person as a function rather than a complete human being seeing someone as a dentist or a waiter or irritating person or whatever. So part object relating results in other people feeling exploited by the person who simply uses them by seeing them as someone who gives information or someone who gives money. 
These objects can also be not um, human beings, but objects. For instance, the home, you could have an object relationship with your house. If your house is giving you problems, you've got a bad object relationship with your house. Same with work. If work is not good, your work becomes a bad object. Or even your university can become a bad object because you have to write an essay for it or whatever. I just want to say a word on greed and envy without going too heavy on you, but Klein writes an awful lot about greed and envy. And it's quite, I want to try and just give you a simple description of the origins of both. So greed, now that I've explained basic theories, greed is the ruthless exploitation of the source of goodness, i.e. the good breast, regardless of its real capacity, how much milk it's got, or whether one's, or, or regardless of one owns immediate need for instance whether or not you're hungry or not but simply fueled by the anxiety the counterpart of the good object i.e the bad depressed will spring forth at any moment so you must take as much as you can while you can okay and this plays out with adults when they want it all despite whether they need it or not and want continuous gratification and want to control all of that Let's look at envy. Now, envy is a destructive impulse from the earliest months against the good breast as a source of life. The urge is to spoil this good breast because it's not out, it's outside of the self and can't be controlled. And so there's annoyance and anger around that. The very goodness of the breast is a constant reminder of what it can't have and, and a reminder of deprivation and separation. And so there is a destructive impulse which develops into envy. As an adult, this plays out where we discard or destroy any possibility of positive help or nurturance. You know, we're too busy fighting it because we're angry about it at the same time. And we probably can't discern between a good or a bad object. There's confusion there as well. So you don't know what's going to be good for you or what's bad for you. Now, there's a critique of her approach. Colleagues of her time were saying that she painted a horrific picture of early infancy. Don't forget they were saying, oh, you don't need to look at a baby so early on. They're, they're looked after. They have a wonderful time. They're, they're fed. Their nappies are changed. They don't have to worry about anything or life at all. So they were really objecting to her crude expressions of selfhood when she talked about internalized breasts and preoccupations of feces and urine. They were really objecting to all of this and, and saw early infancy as a time of little stress and anxiety and that babies can't be capable of things like anger. But Klein is saying that babies meet an unsafe world that they don't understand. They experience anxiety from the start. They feel they experience discomfort and they don't know what to do with this. She says that early development is about how anxiety is experienced and managed. Now, she defended herself when they criticised her um, expressions of selfhood, if you like. And she said that she developed her psychoanalytic language directly from her work with children. And she talked to them and they talked to her in their own natural way, which not wasn't sort of watered down and symbolic and delicate, but it was earthy and blunt. That's how they talked. They said it how it was. Here are some books, my four favourite books, if you like, An Introduction to Object Relations and Our Need for Others and Its Roots in Infancy. But I've also put two books there which are quite nice and they talk about the analytic treatment of a little girl called the Piggle and also a little boy called Dibs. And it just gives you an idea of um, working with children and how you translate um, their language and their expression and so forth. But in the next lecture, we're going to go into um, Kleinian theory in more detail and a little bit how you work in a Kleinian way also. So I hope you found this useful. I hope most importantly that you've understood it. If you've understood this, then you're going to be OK with Klein. OK, I hope you've enjoyed it and I shall speak to you again soon. Bye for now.